Hi, this is Rob Hawley from the Fremont Peak Observatory Association. In this section, we'll talk about what you need to do to plan for Eclipse Day, your timeline during the day, and some brief thoughts about how to process your pictures after. As I said in the previous section, eclipses are over incredibly fast, and you'll be excited, so it's not the best time to be figuring things out. What I'm going to emphasize in this section is some advanced prep that will reduce your risk on Eclipse Day. First, your camera setup. If you have a telephoto lens, you're going to want to set it on manual focus. Similarly, you're going to want to use manual exposure. If you're using an automatic shutter release, then you'll probably set bracket. Otherwise, follow the directions as to how to set up your camera for the computer. I shoot in RAW mode without having the camera produce JPEGs. You can produce JPEGs offline and do it better. Turn the sleep mode off in your camera, but then make sure you test your battery life. Your camera is going to be on for several hours during the eclipse. I would at least make sure it could survive two hours. You're going to want to be recording images as fast as possible. The best way to do that is have the fastest memory chip in your camera that you can buy. Next, practice all the steps you'll need to do the eclipse. This includes stuff like knowing where to, you're going to put your solar filter when you take it off. If you're using a computer control, make sure that you get all the exposures that you want and that everything is operating correctly. I already mentioned in the previous slide, check your battery life and make sure you're not going to run out of batteries in the middle of totality. The more you practice ahead of time and the more that you can do this with muscle memory, the lower risk the eclipse is going to be. For me, focusing the telescope is always one of the biggest problems in eclipse setup. Something I did in Indonesia this year was to download the latest SOHO image. From the SOHO image, I can see the current configuration of sunspots. Knowing where the sunspots are, I can find them while I'm trying to focus. This is an example of SOHO that I took last night. As you can see, there are only a couple of very small sunspots. Well, that's similar to the situation I faced in March. Knowing where to look made it much easier to find the sunspots. And also in March, I was using the 300 millimeter telephoto and not my telescope, so the sun was much smaller. Once I could see the sunspot, I knew I had focus. And when the moon's edge appeared, it was nice and sharp. Next, I want to suggest an eclipse day timeline. I suggest you arrive plenty of time before the eclipse. Two hours is not unreasonable. During that time, you need to set up your equipment, focus, and otherwise organized for when C1 occurs and the rest of the eclipse begins. It takes about 70 minutes from C1 to C2. And for about 45 minutes of the time after C1, the moon is gradually creeping across the face of the sun. That doesn't mean you should be idle during this time. You should take an occasional photo. Check your focus. Check your tracking. Check your batteries. And do a last minute bathroom break. One thing that's important is you need an accurate event time for the particular location you're going to be at. There are a couple ways you can get that. I will be talking about Solar Eclipse Maestro in a moment. But there are also various apps that you can get on your phone. The best answer is to go to the Fred Espinac's Mr. Eclipse website, select the eclipse, and then plug in your location. That will give you detailed event times and altitudes for the eclipse. About two minutes before the eclipse is when the activity is going to really start. I usually replace the solar filter with a baseball cap, oddly a Fremont Peak baseball cap. Also, you should verify that the camera control is working and started if necessary. Verify that the camera is tracking properly. And also look up and notice the change in shadows. Shadows by this point should be starting to get very sharp. And you should start noticing dimming. About 30 seconds before totality, look around and look for shadow bands about 20 seconds, you're going to want to knock your baseball cap off or take your solar filter off as you previously practiced. Wait to take your eyeglasses off until you've confirmed that C2 has actually happened. Otherwise, you're going to get a flash of sun. So totality has now arrived. I use the camera as a telescope. Some people say you shouldn't do that, but that's what I've always done. One of the themes of this series is to encourage you to look at the eclipse and not just photograph it. To help with that, I've listed a few things here that you should specifically look for during totality. Another thing you should consider is taking audio notes. I found those very useful to review what I've seen and remember what after the eclipse. One final warning. As C3 approaches, the bright line of chromosphere is going to appear. 
Once you see this in your camera, it's time to look away. You do not want to get flashed by the sun. Next, let's talk about exposures. The good news is with an eclipse, you'll always capture something. I've used my Libya 2006 photos as a baseline since that's the most complete set of exposures I have. Bear in mind these are f6.3, ISO 100 except as noted. The set of exposures I used were sufficient to capture the entire phenomena from the brightest prominences to Earthshine on the moon. And you could see the wide range of exposures that I used to do so. In the next few slides I'm going to show you the pictures individually and you can just run through them yourself. Remember, if you want to take a look at the original pictures, consult my website robholly.net and follow the links to Libya 06. Note that since getting my 60DA, I've now upped the ISO to 200, which means my exposures are half of what you see here. I want to say only a couple words on processing. As I said previously, I recommend you do not have your camera build JPEG images for you. External tools do a much better job of doing the stretching required to get from raw data into a usable JPEG. If you have a Canon camera, you can use the Canon digital photographic programs. Although Apple Preview does an excellent job in its own right. Or you could use an astronomy program such as PixInsight or your other favorite astronomy program. If you're interested in HDR, or high dynamic range, then you can combine the images using either PixInsight or Photomax. I've used both. One of your takeaways after photographing the eclipses is how different your pictures look than what you actually saw. Well, high dynamic range is a way to recreate what it is you see with your eyes. This picture is, is from the 2016 solar eclipse. The data is mostly from Richard Bearford, and I thank him for uh, use of his data. Finally, let's show you the experience of an eclipse using Solar Eclipse Maestro. 30 seconds. Filters off. Filters off. Ten seconds. Maximum Eclipse.
filters on, filters on. Hopefully that example will show you how much stuff is happening very quickly. If you want to see how I've actually reacted to eclipses, take a look at my videos of Svalbard and Indonesia. Bear in mind in Indonesia I had an extra minute and so I did actually go change the ISO in the camera. But it was also a move that I'd practiced extensively until I could do it within a few seconds. And you can hear from the soundtrack myself taking notes on what I was seeing during the eclipse. Had I tried that same procedure for the US eclipse, I would have run out of time.